Now, when we translate the Chinese tradition this way, what we do is we shoehorn. You know, you use a, in the Chinese it's xie ba zi, you use a shoehorn to, to fit um, the Chinese foot into a Greek sandal. What we're doing is we're putting Greek shoes on the Chinese tradition, and there's a terrible asymmetry in, in, in doing that. And so um, what we want to do is we want to think of how can we take the Chinese tradition on its own terms. If this language is, if this language overwrites the Chinese tradition with ideas that are familiar to us, but that don't have relevance to the Chinese tradition, how do we get to the real ideas of the Chinese tradition? That's the challenge. That's the challenge. And so we can do it. Like I can come here, and if, if we had a semester, you know, I mean, if we, if, we, if we had some time, we could look at the Book of Changes. In the, in the Western tradition, you have metaphysics. You have the concept of a transcendent and, and perfect God from which meaning is derived. This is, this is a starting point. In the Chinese tradition, you have the Book of Changes because in the Chinese world, change will not be denied. The world is experience is constantly unfolding, and we have to find an explanation for the human experience within this kind of processual, emerging concept of experience, of the human experience. As I said before, Chinese philosophy takes us back to the ordinary, every, every moment of the day, the routine experience of the day. Um, so we could take a semester, but one of the ways of doing it is to take a look at Chinese medicine. In the teaching of Chinese medicine, the first year is given over to the study of Chinese philosophy. And I think that the philosophers ought to repay the doctors with the same consideration. And if we want to understand Chinese philosophy, then the study of Chinese medicine is very helpful. Now, what I want to do is I want to take one image from, from uh, Chinese medicine and then use that to talk about this, 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 this notion of Dao De Jing. You know, what does Dao mean? What does De mean? And, uh, and how do we put it together to make, to make it mean something like making this life significant? Um, the, the heart in Chinese medicine is not an organ in the way in which we think about an organ. If we did that to the heart, if we, if we isolated the heart for a minute, it would be a piece of meat. It would be dead. It would, it would, it would have no, no functionality. And so the way in which the heart is thought about in Chinese medicine is that the heart is a focus, is a center of a certain kind of physiological system. That, that the heart is this focus uh, that is interconnected with all of the different organs of the body, with the circulatory system, with the breathing function. And when a Chinese doctor, a Chinese doctor doesn't feel your pulse, a Chinese doctor listens to the rhythm of the human being. In this world of Chinese uh, philosophy, you don't have form and function. That Remember I said a moment ago that it's the book of changes, that if you put form and change together, what do you have? You put form and change together and you have rhythm. You have regularity, you have uh, a kind of unfolding of a process, a, a determinate rhythm of the process. And so the doctor is listening to this kind of symphony of the body, but the, the notion of the heart doesn't start stop with the body. The heart, the, the body is a collaboration with the world. You can't walk unless you collaborate with the ground. You can't breathe unless you collaborate with the air. You can't see unless you collaborate with the sun. And so, so the whole idea is that this human experience, this physiological human experience that takes in nutrients you know, from, from outside, that what we are is we are a focus 
within this whole framework, this whole field of the human experience. But we don't stop there. If, if, if physically, my, connecti my connectivity of my heart with the rest of my body, with this internal landscape and external landscape, if it's functioning properly, then I'm a healthy human being physiologically. But the heart-mind in the Chinese world is not simply a, a physical thing. In fact, it's not a physical thing. That in the Chinese tradition, with body-mind, there's no hyphen. We have to get rid of the hyphen. And so what you're doing with, with, in the Chinese world is this heart-mind, this symphony, is also the psychological, sociological relationships that you have with other people in the world. That, 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 that the connectivity at one level is physiologically, it is physiological, but at another level it's sociological. It has to do with feelings. It has to do with religious uh, experience. It has to do with your cognitive abilities. It has to do with the way in which you are interacting effectively and cognitively with other people who constitute your environment. And if your relationships with these other people are fluid, if the rhythm is good, if, if, it, if, it, if there's a melody in your relationships, then you are a healthy human being sociologically, psychologically. And so this heart-mind is a way of thinking about what it means to be a person within a Confucian tradition, within a Taoist tradition. Now, if you ask this question, if you say, yeah, 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 I understand what you're saying, you know, that you have this kind of physiological, you have this kind of sociological relatedness with the rest of the world, but what's the heart really? What's the heart in itself? That doesn't make any sense in Chinese. That there's no nothing outside of the roles and relationships that locate the heart in a particular focus. There's no nature of a human heart. There's no heart in itself. There's, no, there's nothing that stands behind these processes that constitutes the real heart. It's a focus of these roles and relationships in the body, physiologically, sociologically, that constitute the heart. And so we can say, there's a wonderful passage in William James where William James wants to challenge substance thinking. You know, we have this kind of one-source thinking. And so we, we say, Aaron is a, has great potential. And so that what, what we do, we come out of Aristotle, and we think that when we say that, that there's some kind of potential in him that if it's not constrained, it's going to blossom into this magnificent human being. But this isn't, this isn't Chinese thinking, that we can't talk about the potential of Aaron because the potential of Aaron has to do with how he spends his roles and relationships. Does he locate himself in a vibrant, intellectual, academic community? Does he draw from that community and invent himself in a specific way? That potential is not something that comes before the human experience, it's something that, that, that aggregates pari passu over the career of a human being. It's something that we can only talk about at the end of his career as a human being. Where did he locate himself? What were the roles and relationships in which he made himself, he created himself? And then we can talk about his potential.